Barbara is known among the Italian people to be the ringleader in such illegal rackets as operator of houses of prostitution, alcohol stills, and alcohol transportation. He is feared among people of his own kind and is known to have any undesirable persons removed. He is known to be temperate in his habits. He will drink one or two glasses of beer with customers and occasionally wine at some party. He is not known to have ever become intoxicated. End quote. The legends of America's mobs are woven into the fabric of society and pop culture. We've all seen the movies or heard the tales of these criminal organizations. Their stories of power, wealth, respect, family, greed, betrayal, violence, murder, and mayhem. While the golden age of the mobs may be over, organized crime continues to thrive, and the stories remain as infamous as ever. You're listening to the Gangland History Podcast, hosted by mob historian Jacob Stoops. He tells the true crime biographies of real-life mobsters and dives deep into the plots, subplots, and real facts behind organized crime in America. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Gangland History Podcast. Again, I'll just say formerly the members only podcast. We've got another great show today. Um, we're we're going to be covering part two of the Joseph Barbara, uh, you know, epi- episode. We started with part one. Now we're into part two, in which we get into his business dealings uh, and, of course, Appalachian and the aftermath. Uh, just want to say thank you. Uh, you know, we went over 9,000 subscribers. We're on our way. I think we're already at 9,100. We're working on our way to 10,000. That's kind of my gold number for the early part of the year. And of course, growing it beyond still working on standing up the Patreon channel, uh, but that's going to be available very soon. Still working on converting my current website uh, over membersonlypodcast.com to ganglandhistorypodcast.com. That's still a work in progress, but I thank everybody so far for the support. Uh, I think the reaction to the new branding and kind of the rename has been uh, better than I could have anticipated. Now, uh, you'll probably see my, my my hair's a little longer. I did manage to put on the same shirt. Uh, I will just say, to just to give you a look behind the scenes, you know, when I recorded the Barbara biography, I recorded it front to back end to end and and when i was originally you know doing all of the recording i didn't know how long it was going to go uh and very very quickly as i got into the editing process i said oh my gosh <laughs> this is going to be uh over 2 hours again and you know with my commitment to try to move faster i was like you know what i think i've got to move this into two parts so i'm recording an intro for the second part, after I have already recorded everything. Uh, so for those of you that have not watched part one, highly, highly recommend that you go over and watch part one. I'll put it in the uh, in the link uh, in the description of this video on YouTube, as well as on the audio version of the podcast, although that's a little bit more challenging to get to. But for those of you that haven't watched part one, let me just catch you up. So if you don't know anything about who Joseph Barbara was, of course, if you know a little bit about mafia history, you'll know that his house uh, was the house that was chosen to host the 1957 Appalachian Conference, which, of course, as you know, turns into a fiasco. And that's what we're going to be covering today, where all the bosses from around the country go and meet. And they all, for the most part, get picked up by law enforcement and the mafia which had been, you know, existing somewhat below the radar by that point, becomes front page news. Now, Barbara himself was, before Appalachian, an incredibly, incredibly respected member of the mafia going, you know, all the way back to the 20s and 30s. If you don't know who Barbara was, born in 1905 in Castellamare del Golfo, Sicily, emigrates to the United States at the age of 16 in 1921, starts off here in this country, emigrates through New York, but eventually moves into northeastern Pennsylvania and at times resides in northeastern Pennsylvania, southern New York, kind of right on that border. 
starts, you know, his his uh, journey in the United States working at a shoe factory, ultimately quits, gets the notice of the, you know, somehow attracts the notice of the local mafia Don in the area, the, you know, the Don being the head of the family that would become the Buffalino crime family in later years. Uh, and that man's name is Santo Volpe. We'll talk a little bit more about him. Uh, you know, in today's today's episode, and we'll talk about kind of the the hierarchy of bosses, the succession, so on and so forth. We we really alluded to that in the first part, and at some point, Barbara becomes the driver and bodyguard for Volpe, and of course, in the twenties. So this is in the nineteen twenties and early thirties. You still are in the full throes of prohibition, right? So you're right in the middle of. All of the bootlegging, big money coming in, even in northeastern Pennsylvania, and a lot of infighting. And that is where Barbara really makes his mark as a hitman. He was involved in at least four murders, uh, and we covered that pretty extensively in part one. At least he was accused uh, and charged in some cases with suspicion. Other times he was brought in on suspicion and no charges were actually filed. So he was able to get off without any legal ramifications in all four of those cases. But I think it's pretty well known historically that he kind of made his bones in about the early part of the 1930s as a hitman for the Volpe organization, which, as I just said, becomes the Buffalino organization in later years. Uh, and that's kind of where this story picks up. Uh, the transition from Barbara becoming a, a hitman, moving himself in the mid-30s into legitimate business enterprises, and that's where we'll pick up the story today. But before we get into the story, again, as I just said, I am working on moving towards 10,000 subscribers and working on standing up a Patreon channel. So please, uh, if you like this video, please subscribe, hit like, do all the things that you need to do. Turn on that bell to get notifications. We're trying to build. We're trying to grow. Uh, and just know that, that I'm always going to do my best to deliver quality information. And while some of the stories you'll hear are, are well known, a lot of what I dig up and a lot of what viewers of my channel are really, really passionate about is my ability to go back and give you a lens into material that is often just forgotten. It's lost to the ages, and I try to bring it back into the forefront uh, and provide information that people don't necessarily know. So that's kind of my value proposition. Uh, if you like this video, please, you know, help help my channel grow, you know, help the algorithm show the video to more people, uh, and just know that I appreciate it. But without further ado, let's get into part two of the Joseph Barbara biography. In January of 1937, Joseph Barbara, along with Charles Barbara, his, his uh, brother, and a man named Giuseppe Joe or Joseph Genovese would file for a certificate of incorporation in Endicott, New York, for the Endicott Beverage Company, Inc., for the purposes of selling alcohol and non-alcoholic malt beverages. Now, it's worth noting that papers 20 years later would claim that this business was founded around 1934, not 1937. But suffice it to say, mid to, you know, starting to get into the late 30s, they, they form a business together, Barbara, his brother, and Joe Genovese. Then in February of 1937, Barbara would get approval and permits to build a bottling plant for an estimated cost of around $9,000 in total, the equivalent of about 190 k in today's money. That year, the Endicott Beverage Company would report doing $500,000 a year in revenue, which is approximately, this is crazy, $10.6 million in today's money, which is an incredible amount of money for a company that quite literally just started and just opened the doors, just built their plant, right? They got up and running very, very quickly, but there's a reason. An FBI report in later years would identify the reason for the success. Barbara and his partner, Joe Genovese, weren't your average businessmen, right? Uh, they were using strong arm methods to ensure people did business with their company 
and the fear that their respective reputations instilled compelled most area businesses to comply. Competitors were pushed aside and retail establishments were quite simply forced to carry Barbara and Genovese's products, which allowed Barbara and his partner to quickly become fairly wealthy men over the subsequent years, though in the, the early years, they were noted as being pretty heavily investing into their business. This rapid expansion would quickly get them on law enforcement's radar, and several reports would detail their tactics. Quote, Report dated March 3rd, 1937. This report indicates subject was operating the Endicott Beverage Company, 46 Garfield Avenue, Endicott, New York. This address is listed for his in-laws. The report indicates that at this time, the subject and Joe Genovese were constructing a new building at 7 Badger Avenue and were doing an annual business of $500,000. This report indicates his worth is $10,000 in real estate and personal effects of $7,000 invested in the business. The report further indicated that the subject is well regarded in the community and there was no personal criticism of him. The following is verbatim from the report. The corporation is now under investigation by the state board because of their rapid expansion and unfair business method. It is stated that they sold a good deal of beer by strong arm methods. If the proprietor of the store or restaurant is not in, when the driver calls, he will roll in three or four barrels and get the bartender to sign for them and then later collect for the delivery. The report further indicates they have nine trucks and six pleasure cars. Report dated February 23, 1938. Endicott Beverage Company was organized four years ago. The business has expanded rapidly since its organization and within the past six months moved into a building which was constructed at a cost of $40,000. Subject's net worth is listed as $20,000 and consists of savings, real estate, and investment in business. The following information appears in this report. Informants state that he has been investing all of his money in business and has had little ready cash on hand, but the summer season is only a short distance away and it is predicted he will do big business this year. The report indicated the following information in regard to now. Resides 405 Loader Avenue, Endicott, New York. Prior to coming to this city five years ago, he lived in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and it is rumored that he was connected with the white slave racket there. His reputation here now is good. His habits were listed as a moderate drinker, end quote. Now, uh, after an accident involving a truck at the Endicott Beverage Company, Getting into the late 1930s, the business was taken over by the Mission Beverage Company with Barbara still in control in around 1939. The Mission Beverage Company would shortly thereafter become JB Industries, Inc., though Barbara would get involved in the Canada Dry Bottling Company in October of 1940 and would become an exclusive Canada Dry bottler in either 1948 or 1953, based on which report you read, which would pretty much be the legitimate businesses that Barbara would be associated with in the latter part of his life. He was pretty well known as being associated with Canada Dry. So the next time you're drinking a Canada Dry ginger ale, just know that in certain parts of the country, the mob used to control uh, at least the manufacturing coming out of that facility. So I like to, <laughs> I like to 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 think about that. It's uh, quite funny. I like to when I walk around stores, look at certain products, uh, and think about which ones were at some point created and or controlled by mobsters. Anyways, according to some notes I came across, the predecessor company of Joseph Barbara's Canada Dry Bottling Company in Endicott, New York, as the uh, was the Mission Beverage Company, also of Endicott. The Mission Beverage Company was said to be closely associated with a company called the Darling Ice Cream Company out of Syracuse, New York, which was owned by a man named Sam Scro, who was eventually listed as a director of the Canada Dry Bottling Company. Now, why is this relationship significant, you might ask? Because, I'm going to tell you, because there are some connections here that show the connectivity, and I'm always amazed by the connectivity of all the inner locking relationships in the underworld and that, that ultimately ladder back to our subject, Joseph Barbara. Sam Scro, the owner of the Darling Ice Cream Company, had two sons, Anthony and Vincent. 
In turn, the sons had some very important connections through marriage. You see, Anthony, Sam Scro's son, was married to the daughter of a man named Severio Sam Monachino, a top hoodlum out of Auburn, New York, while Vincent Scro was married to the daughter of none other than Stefano Magadino, the boss of Buffalo, New York. Now, that's quite a bit of like playing the playing the connections and uh, this, you know, playing the mafia version of six degrees of Kevin Bacon. But quite honestly, it's a hop, skip and a jump between Joe Barbara and some really, really powerful mob figures. In this case, a lot of times you'll see the Barbara's associated with the Buffalo family. Uh, and so it would make sense that he would be almost directly, uh, in this case, connected right to Stefano Magadino. Now, additionally, Barbara's Mission Beverage Company would also show up in reports as employing, and this is a really good one, you're going to like this, as employing none other than Russell Buffalino himself. The reports would go on to note that the men were really close friends, and Buffalino from this point on in the episode is, is going to be playing an increasingly large role, and we're going to talk about the interplay between Barbara and Buffalino for sure. Uh, and the report would go on to say that the Mission Beverage Company employed Buffalino from 1944 to 1945. Guess what? They employed his skills as a mechanic to fix machinery Barbara's plant. And I think by now, it's pretty well known that that Russell Buffalino was was uh, a pretty handy trained m mechanic. And you kind of you also you see that in the Irishman. Why would why would Barbara be giving Buffalino a job? Well, bu uh, Buffalino at this point also was was an up and comer in Pittston. Uh, he was one of the men of Montedoro, and you know this of course was ostensibly to allow Russell Buffalino to have a legitimate source of income to report from a tax standpoint, and it had the 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 double benefit that Buffalino just happened to be excellent at fixing things, right? So it was a win win for for both parties. Now, getting into the 1940s, in February of 1940, Barbara would show up in the Binghamton press as having successfully mediated a trucking strike, indicating that he, by that time, was, was you know, a power within local unions. Uh, in this case, 80 drivers in particular employed across 15 beer distributors out of local 693 of the chauffeurs union went on strike looking for better wages. And Barbara serving as the informal spokesperson for the Broome County Beer Distributors Association, negotiated an end to the strike, which in actuality, you would think that it would be the opposite, but which in actuality ended up raising wages for the drivers who went from $26 per week and they were seeking 30, they actually landed at about $28 to $29 per week across a three-year deal. Now for me, Personally, I was, you know, not surprised to see a mob figure participating in union activity, especially at that point in time. But I was surprised to see that a race was actually, uh, you know, was actually put forth for the drivers instead of just their heads getting busted in as a way to break the strike, which, of course, as we know, Barbara was a violent person uh, and and certainly prone to probably doing some some head breaking. Uh, reports would also indicate that Barbara had become a very heavy, heavy contributor in local politics as well, specifically the Broome County Republican Committee, though any funds that he contributed were almost always not attributed to him, often being credited as donations coming from other people. So they were secret donations through a proxy, but ultimately coming from him as a way to exert his control over local politics. So... By this point, Barbara's into legal and illegal operations, is dealing with unions, has asserted some level of control over local politics. And all of this together, uh, in addition to being uh, a violent guy, a feared guy, makes him very powerful. Uh, by the early 1940s, Barbara's reputation had expanded and he was considered a leader in the underworld with his hands not just in his legitimate business, but in a wide array of criminal activities. An FBI report dated to 1941 would say the following about Barbara. Quote, Barbara is known among the Italian people to be the ringleader in such illegal rackets as operator of houses of prostitution, alcohol stills, and alcohol transportation. 
He is feared among people of his own kind and is known to have any undesirable persons removed. He is known to be temperate in his habits. He will drink one or two glasses of beer with customers and occasionally wine at some party. He is not known to have ever become intoxicated. End quote. In January of 1944, the Mission Beverage Company plant in Endicott, New York, burned down in a very serious fire in which one fireman was hurt and 100,000 pounds of sugar was damaged with reports showing that Barbara himself aided the fireman in taking inventory with the contents being insured for $20,000. Now, could it have been a real fire or just a ploy to make a quick insurance claim? Who knows, but the fire itself was actually said to have been the worst blaze uh, in the Endicott area that it had seen in the previous year. Uh, It's around this same year, in August of 1944, that the wealthy Barbara is alleged to have purchased the large 58-acre estate that he'd become most famous for in Owego, uh, which is near, and again, forgive me the pronunciation, but Owego, which is near Appalachian, New York, thus moving across state lines from his previous residence in Old Forge, Pennsylvania. And throughout the 30s, he moved quite a bit, so he had uh, several different addresses in and around the area. All right, so let me give you a quick overview of the area for those that are unfamiliar uh, with it. Uh, You have Appalachian, which, of course, is New York. Uh, If you slightly back out on the map, and again, in the audio version, this is going to be hard to follow, but on YouTube, uh, it's going to make a little bit more sense. Uh, But I just want to give everybody an idea of really how all the the big cities uh, that I'm talking about really relate to each other. So you've got Appalachian, and uh, you can see that Appalachian is is just a little bit north of the uh, Pennsylvania state line, the Northeast Pennsylvania state line, uh, along a a river. And then to the northwest, you have Owego, New York, uh, which is where Barbara had resided uh, resided for a time. And if you back out a little bit, or you look to the northeast of Appalachian, you can see uh, the city of Endicott, uh, which again is pretty pretty well associated with, uh, with Barbara. If you go a little bit further to the northeast, you're going to see Binghamton, uh, which is again a pretty important city for, for Barbara and for this story. Uh, if you, you know, back out and you start looking a little bit southeast, you're going to to run into Old Forge, which we know was uh, a pretty significant address in Barbara's early career where he resided. Next to Old Forge is Scranton. Uh, just to the southwest of Scranton is Pittston, uh, where, of course, we know the Pittston mob is is pretty pretty central. And again, all these areas are not. I'm not going to say they're all right next to each other, but they're not far away. So it would would make sense that all of the gangsters from this area would kind of uh, centralize in these locations. And then if you look at Pennsylvania as a state, right, uh, and you look at the cursor on the map, right, Appalachian is right by the border. And then just down the road from Scranton and Pittston is, of course, New York City. In the southeastern part of Pennsylvania, of course, you've got Philadelphia and then just across the river, New Jersey, uh, which, of course, big mob presence. The southwestern part of Pennsylvania, you have, of course, the Pittsburgh family and the Pittsburgh mafia. If you start to look slightly northwest, you've got Buffalo, and the Buffalo mafia. Uh, you've got Rochester, the Rochester, uh, the Rochester faction of the Buffalo mafia. You go straight north, you've got Syracuse, which as we know in Utica, uh, which we just talked about having a, a, a mob presence. And then if you venture to the west in Ohio, you've got the Cleveland family. And of course, the Cleveland and the Pittsburgh family share Youngstown. So all in all, this is a this is a majorly active place. Uh, but I wanted to give you an idea of where 
Appalachian sits. It's a really centralized location, you know, right on the southern border of New York and then in northeastern Pennsylvania. On the property, he'd build his house, which would cost him roughly $250,000, the equivalent of $4.3 million in today's money. So pretty, pretty expensive home. And one thing I'll say, and I'm just going to be honest here, I'm going to be pretty candid, is that in the pictures you often see of his house and his property, it doesn't really look that large. It's it's described as a mansion on a hill. And I guess based on the purchase price and and even though you hear stories of just how big the place was, I um I don't I don't quite get it. Uh, after some research, I guess I came to find out that there were actually several smaller homes on the property. So I'm guessing that the house most commonly shown is actually one of the smaller homes, although it could be the main home. I don't know. Uh, And in doing even more digging, descriptions of the estate have the property as being 58 acres. Okay, well, that's that's a large property with an 11 room main house. Okay, that's that's pretty big. Uh, A living room with dimensions of 32 by 52 feet. I guess I'll take that as 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 big. Again, that's hard to visualize, uh, but doesn't necessarily sound like a mansion to me. And I got to be honest, like candidly, when I've seen pictures, I've been like, eh. Not really that impressed, but again, I'm going to take everybody's word for it that it was it was a mansion for for that time or any other time. The 1958 re- report would continue to cover even more misdeeds by Barbara, though they'd get to be over the years slightly less violent as he legitimized him, himself and moved further away from the day to day handling of the more thuggish aspects of the mob life. In 1946, Barbara would would run into some legal issues. So, of course, you, you had the the fire at his pro, at his um, at his factory, which again, that nothing was ever tied in there to be illegal. Who knows? Uh, but in 1946, he would run into legal issues, though they were nothing that he really couldn't overcome, and represented little more than a slap on the wrist. Now, to provide a little more color, on May 14, 1946, a federal grand jury handed down indictments charging the Binghamton branch of Empire Foods as well as Barbara's Mission Beverage Company with violating rationing regulations in alleged deals involving 300,000 pounds of sugar. Now, the indictment, which contained 41 counts, named Barbara as the president of the Mission Beverage Company and alleged that Mission Beverage Company had acquired the 300,000 pounds of sugar in 1944 and 1945 without providing valid ration evidence. And a lot of mobsters, most notably probably Carlo Gambino, were well known to be making money off of ration stamps and the a black market that had sprung up of sorts due to to the rationing of common goods during World War II. Uh, so this does not surprise me that Barbara's company uh, was tied up in this, and that he might have been uh, trying to trying to make a you know a quick buck or work his you know work his way around or get something for for cheaper. Um, but in this case, it appears that he got caught. Barbara ultimately would plead guilty to the 34 count federal indictment and he would pay a fine of $5,000, which is roughly $77,000 in today's money. So it's not nothing. Uh, But other than that, both he and his company would get off without really too much more hassle, save for some requirements related to producing additional rationing currency, the company would pretty much go on operating for many more years under Barbara's stewardship. By 1950, a 44-year-old Barbara would show up in census records, listing his occupation as president of a bottling company, as we know, and living along Route 17 Old Road, going west from the county line in Owego, New New York, which is near the county of uh, Tioga, near McFall Road. And actually, this is really south of Appalachia, and I know I just kind of showed you the map. This this uh, McFall Road kind of runs uh, just south of Appalachian proper. And that's actually where his estate sits. His his address in this census report was actually a little hard to uh, to make up on the map. But if you search 625 McFall Road, Appalachian, New York, 
you'll find that his building more or less still still exists. And again, I'm going to take the, the users on YouTube into Google Maps. But again, you can see uh, if, if you're looking at the street view, 625 McFall Road, you just do a little bit of, uh, a little bit of moving yourself up the road, and there it is. Uh, you can see this is the current residence. It looks like a, a place called Hidden, Hidden Farm. Uh, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. Uh, but you can see this is one of the buildings. This is definitely one of the buildings. You can see the original brick. It is still there, it's certainly in a, a very dilapidated and not a, a mansion looking state today. Uh, but it's still there, 625 McFall Road, at least as far as I can tell. This looks like the house that you see in pictures. Not that I'm trying to draw any any attention uh, necessarily to the people that live here today, but I just, you know, I, again, I think it's pretty cool to check these things uh, check these things out. Now, reports dated to the early 1950s would indicate that as Barbara aged. He slowly moved away from, like I said, the, the thuggish, strong-arm sorts of tactics that had made his business a success in the 1930s with one report uh, that would say the following, quote, when he first started out, he rode roughshod over competitors and forced his products on retail users, but gradually gave up these tactics. His business operations for some years have been ordinary and normal. He is regarded as a person who pays his obligations and lives within his means. End quote. Now, on to another line of thought. And again, like we're talking about where does he fit in the family? Uh, and I, I haven't even really talked about, well, where does he, where does he get made? Uh, so obviously he's, he's part of the family in and around Northeastern, Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I would venture to guess that at some point in the 1930s, when he starts doing hits for the boss, Santo Volpe, that at some point, either he he is just ushered into the family when all the families organized in 1931 and and he's just in, or at some point in the early 30s, my guess is he gets made. Again, I didn't come across any official documentation when Barbara joined, but it's clear that he was a made guy. He was part of, part of the mob, part of the group, uh, of course, which is why he knows all these people and why they eventually hold the meeting at his house. When you read about the Buffalino crime family, there are often conflicting reports concerning the lines of succession after Santo Volpe allegedly stepped down in the early part of the 1930s, though Volpe himself would retain significant influence in the area and within the family to some degree as maybe sort of an, an emer emeritus status, right? <laughs> right? Uh, a retired but respected status for roughly 30 years after he would step down, about 20 to 30 years. Now, some reports uh, suggest that Russell Buffalino took over as boss in the late 1940s, while other reports suggest that the man in charge of the family was actually our subject, Joe Barbara, who has at times been speculated to be a part of the Magadino organization out of Buffalo, which would make sense with Stefano Magadino also originating from Castellamari del Golfo. Uh, so that kind of, you know, the, the tie to the same area in Sicily would make sense. It's not what I found. I was able to locate a report from 1969 specifically that discussed Barbara's role and potential ascension to boss. Quote, in regarding to Joe Barbara, informant was questioned concerning his official role in LCN. Informant advised that Barbara was the head of his own family and was the boss. The family which Barbara had is now known as the Buffalino family. It is to be noted informant previously stated that Barbara was a Capodicina in LCN and this was discussed with informant. Informant advised if he had so identified Barbara in the past as a Capodicina, this information was incorrect and he was actually boss of his own family. End quote. 
Now, I was able to, to cross-reference. So again, when you see something like this, especially with an informant flip-flopping, it's important to cross-reference and look at other reports to get an understanding of exactly, you know, centering up what's what's going on. And I was able to cross-reference this with another report from 1969, which of course occurred uh, a decade after Barbara's death, that corroborated the assumption that Barbara, not Buffalino, became boss of the Buffalino, the, the family that would become known the Buffalinos, prior to the family being taken over by Russell Buffalino. It would also notate Russell potentially stepping in for a time to help the Lucchese family after Tommy Lucchese's death in the 60s from cancer. Quote, with respect to the existence of the Buffalino family of LCN, it is pointed out that the existence of this family was not established through use of electronic surveillance. Redacted has advised that to his knowledge, Russell Buffalino is a Capodicina in the family formerly headed by Thomas Lucchese. However, Redacted has advised that Joe Barbara, when living, was the head of his own family and was the boss. The family which Barbara headed is now known as the Buffalino family. New York has advised that Redacted is considered by them to be a highly valuable and knowledgeable informant. Despite this, the Bureau may not wish to go on record saying there is a such thing as the Buffalino family until such time as additional corroborating intelligence is available. It is pointed out for the Bureau, Joseph Barbara Sr. was from Castellamare del Golfo, province of Trapani, Sicily, Italy, whereas Russell Buffalino is from Montadoro, province of Caltanissetta. Both Joseph Bonanno and Stefano Magadino are from the Castellamare del Golfo and, and Angelo Bruno is from the province of Caltanissetta. If there is any merit to the possibility that the LCN families which exist in the United States are extension of original families which existed in Sicily, Italy, it would appear that Barbara's successor, if he was a boss, should have come from the area of Castellamare del Golfo, end quote. So, Another report corroborated that Barbara was, in fact, likely the boss of what became the Buffalino family. Additionally, I think we know now that Buffalino was not part of the Lucchese family, though he had a history of stepping in and helping to run New York families in times of trouble. And it's pretty well known by this point that he spent some time helping run the Genovese crime family uh, in, I believe, the 70s. Uh, and I think the thing that really vexed me in all of this were the the origins of a lot of these people. The Buffalino family had traditionally been led by what were called the men of Montedoro, uh, men from Montedoro, Sicily. So to have someone from Castellamare del Golfo running the family for a time didn't necessarily align to what I would consider to be the clannish nature of some of these families. And I honestly would have expected Barbara to be more a part of the Magadino family. But alas, this is now multiple reports from different informants saying the same thing. And because in journalism, though I'm not a journalist, uh, you have to have kind of the rule of three sources. So that's two. And here's another report discussing that Barbara was the head of his own family and not a part of the Buffalino family, John Montana and Stefano Magadino's family, uh, you know, up at, out, out in Buffalo. Quote, redacted, did not use the word Don in describing the heads of the mafia, but he did say that Joseph Barbara Sr. was the leader of a geographic section which extended into New York as far as Auburn and south into Pennsylvania as far as and including Hazleton. He said Montana was not a leader and said that Montana belonged to another group other than that over which Barbara was the leader, end quote. So again, the Montana being referred to is John Montana, the really influential uh, member of the Buffalo Magadino crime family. Now, let me put on, uh, let me just, that's three sources. Let me put a bow on this and provide what I consider to be the clincher, along with a little early history of what became known as the Buffalino crime family from a really fantastic 1965 report discussing LCN activities in the upstate Pennsylvania area. Quote, PHT-8 advised on March 10, 1955, that Steve Latour came to the United States and settled in Pittston, PA in 1904. 
The mafia was then in existence. After Steve Latour had saved a few dollars, he sent his money to Santo Volpe, who lived in the same village in Sicily as did Steve Latour, namely Montadoro. Volpe, when he came to the United States, also settled in Pittston, PA. Later, Charles Buffalino came to the United States and also settled in Pittston, PA. Latour, Volpe, and Buffalino were all members of the Mafia, and eventually Santo Volpe became head of the Mafia in the Pittston, PA area. During the early years, Volpe reigned as Mafia boss in Pittston, PA. Steve Latour was his very close friend. Latour was a successful coal operator in the Pittston, PA area, and looked after Volpe financially, making Volpe a partner in his coal operation. From this time on, Volpe prospered using his position as head of the mafia to great advantage. When Volpe's mafia superior realized his personal business affairs were put ahead of his mafia business, he was eased out as mafia boss and John Schiandra was put in charge. In about 1942, Volpe continued his mafia membership, but was more or less in a retired capacity. At about this time, Volpe demanded great respect from other mafia members. John Schiandra remained in charge of the mafia in the Pittston area until his death when Russell Buffalino was made head of the organization. This change took place in about 1947 or 1948. According to PHT8 statements in 1955, Buffalino was in charge of mafia affairs in the anthracite area and his immediate superior was Joseph Barbara of Binghamton, New York. It was PHT8's opinion at this time Barbara was in charge of activities in northern New York and portions of Pennsylvania with another man on the level of Barbara operating out of either Philadelphia or Wilmington, Delaware. Informant said Lucky Luciano was and continued to be the head of the mafia organization as of 1955. PHT8 said in 1955, Buffalino was the immediate supervisor of John Perino and that Perino had the following persons directly under him. John Salvo, Sam Cometa, Rosario Montanto, Angelo Polizzi, William Medico, Angelo Medico, Luis Consagra, Joseph Contessa, Joseph Scaliat, possibly Angelo Schiandra, end quote. So again, this is just another report laying out the line of succession uh, that would discuss the transfer of power between Volpe, then John Schiandra, and finally to Russell Buffalino in the 1940s, mentioning Barbara as Buffalino's not just employer, but superior. So this would indicate to me that uh, I think the Pittston group operated to some degree independently with Barbara sitting over top of everything, kind of as the de facto boss, even though Buffalino was the guy kind of running things in the Pittston area, quote unquote, the the acting boss in Pittston. I don't, I don't know what you would want to call it. A little bit confusing. Uh, a later note from 1968 would indicate that by 1957, whether Barbara was his overseer or not, Buffalino was in control of the family in Pittston at the very least. Quote, in regard to Russell Buffalino, informant related that he has his own Cosa Nostra family in the Pittston, Pennsylvania area, and there are about 50 members. The members of this family reside in the smaller towns around Pittston and are engaged in the garment business. Buffalino is a frequent visitor to the New York City area, and when he is in town, he is usually with Jimmy Plumeri, a soldier in the Lucchese family. Informant advised Buffalino is in no way connected with the Lucchese group, but they have common interest in the garment business. Informant could not recall at this time the name of the underboss in this family, but he had been introduced to him at the Red Sauce, a restaurant in New York City. Informant described Buffalino's underboss as an old-time greaseball. Informant advised that he is personally acquainted with Buffalino and has had lunch with him in the New York City area several times. Informant was introduced to Buffalino at Appalachia, and at the time, Buffalino was introduced as the head of the family in Pittston, Pennsylvania. End quote. <laughs> and finally, even... A note stemming from the 1989 Pennsylvania Crime Commission report more or less corroborates the line of succession that I just discussed, right? So 
Uh, I think there's some validity to the idea that Barbara was, generally speaking, the Boston overseer of the area and that Buffalino was at one point subordinate to some degree to him. Uh, and one note would actually call Barbara the real Mr. Big of Mafia, if that tells you anything. And the, the question I'll just ask everybody is, are you confused yet? Because quite honestly, when I was trying to sort out the information of who exactly the boss was and whom was over, who was over whom, uh, who, who took orders from whom, uh, and after kind of taking in all of the information and attempting to really synthesize it, sort out fact from fiction, like I said, my boss is, or my guess is that Barbara and Buffalino didn't really care who was the boss. They were good friends. They were, you know, helping each other to some degree. They were okay with a power sharing setup, which makes sense for Buffalino. He was a pragmatic sort of guy. And while the commission may have technically put Barbara over Buffalino or even Buffalino in charge with Barbara having a power role in, in his, in his area, it's clear that the two men were able to coexist pretty harmoniously, uh, and in the end, I guess it really doesn't matter when you have that sort of a situation where where both parties are very much OK with power sharing. Reminds me a little bit of Ocardo and Paul Rica, where it didn't really matter who was the boss. They were both the power in the area. Uh, you know, it's it's clear to me that it really didn't matter. And it really, you know, both men were able to exist and be very powerful in their own right. And as we know, Russell went on to be maybe one of the most powerful Cosa Nostra members in the history of of the mafia after Barbara was gone. And by the way, uh, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the person feeding the FBI this information, who was an attendee at Appalachian, might have been Carmine Lombardozzi, who had fallen out of favor by that point with, within the Gambino family, but was in a high enough position to be privy to this information. So that, again, that's just a guess, not sure. Now, skipping back to the timeline and Joseph Barbara, if you remember, we're in the early 1950s, just a few years away from Appalachian, and Barbara is still running his business, the Canada Dry Bottling Company. It was, by this point, full-time the Canada Dry Bottling Company because in June of 1953, it was at this time um, pretty much full-time the Canada Dry Bottling Company. They were exclusive by this point, just bottling Canada for Canada Dry. Now, in June of 1953, his business would again hit a little bit of a rough patch when the New York State Supreme Court, uh, specifically the Justice Joseph P. Molinari, who I think I've mentioned on this podcast a few times, ordered the State Liquor Authority, the SLA, to attempt to cancel the company's license, which more or less was an attempt to put the Canada Dry Bottling Company out of business. You, can't, you know, if you don't have a you don't have a license to to operate, uh, well, you can't do business. Among the reasons behind the decision, the SLA charged that a man named Sam Galante, a director and stockholder of the company, had not notified the SLA of certain old arrests and a 22 year old conviction on a charge of possessing a revolver pretty uh looks like they were uh, quite honestly like that's a pretty weak accusation for a really really old really really old charge and it just looks like they were just out to get them uh the sla also maintained that the company maintained its books and records in such a fashion as to conceal the true nature of the financing of the licensed business and the manipulation of the records in that respect indicates an intention on the part of this licensee to conceal the true facts thereof from the authority. Now, according to my research, Sam Galante was part of the Galante clan who came over from Castellamari del Golfo, of which Barbara's mother also belongs. She was a Galante as well. Don't forget that. And although his relation uh, to people like Carmine Galante, who we'll discuss in a moment, is unknown, they did share the same surname and birthplace. So Sam Galante, the, there was a huge Galante faction in Castellamari del Golfo. Barbara's mother was a Galante. So small world, crazy, crazy connections. According to the article... Galante said he came to Endicott in 1938 or 1939 and became associated as an employee and partial investor with the Mission Beverage Company, the forerunner to the Canada Dry Bottling Company. 
As you might expect, Barbara and his lawyers would fight the charges and a legal battle would ensue. An affidavit by assistant auditor Julius Fine, who had conducted an examination of the company's books, claimed some irregularities. We'll get into those. Uh, Quote, The General Journal and General Ledger contained an entry under the date July 31st, 1945, charging Joseph Barbara for $65,000 and setting up liabilities under payable for Angelo Polisi, $15,000, Santo Volpe, $10,000, Charles Buffalino, $25,000, Luis Consagra, $5,000, and Luis Pagnotti, $10,000, and that said general... Uh, journal gave the explanation for the above enumerated monies as follows to record notes given for working capital loans during 1944 and 1945, which were credited in error to Joseph Barbara. On this subject, Mr. Chernin said the SLA say other people other than those listed as stockholders have $65,000 invested in this company. If that were so, that would be a serious offense. Mr. Barbara has had to borrow money at different times, particularly during the OPA days when the company had troubles. Joseph Barbara personally borrowed the $65,000 and then he brought it to the corporation as a loan from him. These four or five men who loaned the money said to Mr. Barbara, we don't want to get involved with your corporation. We know you will loan money to you. Mr. Chernin added that Mr. Barbara then decided he wanted something on the record to show he had gotten the $65,000 from these men so that the loans would be repaid by the corporation in the event of his death, end quote. Now, again, I'm not an accountant, so please, all of you accountants and people more familiar with the ins and outs of money, uh, hit me up in the, in the comments. But I think it's clearly an attempt uh, not to to hide the source of money, but to ensure that Barbara himself wouldn't be on the hook to pay the loan back, ensuring that it would go to the corporation after he was gone. Now, the part that I don't understand, and I'm not certain why he didn't get in serious hot water with his mob compatriots, was with respect to putting these men's name names down on paper. These were all, to my knowledge, known mob-related people, uh, and I, I can't understand how he honestly you know, that wasn't used as a reason to take a shot at Barbara and potentially get himself killed. Uh, and there, the only thing I could think is that there just had to be some behind the scenes agreement where everybody involved was okay with officially being down on paper for something. Uh, it seemed, seemed like a big no-no. Ultimately, Barbara's Canada Dry Bottling Company would be granted a renewal of its license in August of 1953, and although the SLA would even appeal even deep into 1954 and would reignite the, you know, the chase in 1955, and Judge Molinari would call them arbitrary and capricious in their decision, the company would go on operating pretty prosperously. Essentially, you know, they, they were able to get through this little, this little issue, crisis averted, uh, and you know, the government in this case was pretty, pretty much trying to put Barbara out of business. They had it in for him. Now, speaking of that prosperity, a note in the late 1950s would suggest that Barbara's Canada Dry Bottling Plant was grossing at that point in time over a half million dollars, which equates to about five to six million dollars in today's money per year. So Barbara, by that point, was likely a millionaire many times over. Now, continuing Barbara's mafia affairs, there are notes in FBI reports showing that a year before Appalachian, so this is 1956, Barbara was noted as having meetings in Binghamton, New York, with Bonanno crime family heavyweights Frank Garofalo, John Bonventre boss, Joseph Bonanno, as well as a man named Louis Volpe in Binghamton, New York. Louis Volpe, in this case, was actually one of the aliases of the infamous Carmine Galante. Now, there are often reports that cite Carmine Galante as receiving a speeding ticket in October of 1956 in Windsor, New York, which is not far from Binghamton, New York. And this is it. This is the the meeting being referenced. Uh, People say, hey, they had the the Appalachian in the same place the year before. Why did they? Why did they do that? This is it. Uh, according to the report, on October 18, 1956, a New York State trooper stopped a car for speeding in Windsor. 
in the automobile were John bon- Bonventre, Frank Garofalo, and Carmine Galante. Now, Galante would actually give a false name at first and presented a driver's license issued in the name of one Joseph Jobeck de Palermo of 246 Elizabeth, New York. Joseph de Palermo was actually a very high-ranking figure within the Lucchese crime family who, at that point in time, was under indictment for narcotics violations. Now, why Galante had his license is, uh, well, it's it's pretty much unknown. I'm, I'm, I can't really answer that question. But as you see, Barbara, who was in his early 50s at this time, this is just another indication of his big time connections. And based on that meeting and the players involved, my guess was that he was either about to or was already into, to some degree, narcotics trafficking, which the Bonanos by this point were, they were like the Ivy League of the mafia in, in narcotics tracking. They were pretty much the leaders. There are also reports that indicate Barbara liked to put on a big spread. So that made his place, especially considering how central it was uh, to all the mob families in the area, made him kind of an ideal host. His place was out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, He was was an ideal host until he wasn't. (laughs) Uh, By this point, one informant would describe Barbara's high rank and the level of respect he was being afforded. And this one is a doozy for sure. You're going to like this one. Quote, The informant said that from his observations in the Binghamton, Endicott, New York area, Joseph Barbara Sr. does not have any one individual who would be known as his right-hand man. He said Barbara is looked looked upon in the area by the Sicilians there as a king and maybe the head of the Sicilian group there, end quote, uh, a king. (laughs) So pretty, pretty influential. Uh, So again, I'm just trying to paint a picture of how important this guy this guy was. Uh, just giving you an idea, he was very respected, uh, very very well thought of by his peers, both legitimate and illegitimate. Uh, they saw him, uh, you know, which looking down the road, I think this is why he gets tapped to be the person who hosts the Appalachian meeting. Outside of the fact that, well, his estate, like I said, it's out in the middle of nowhere really is. Again, go to Google Maps and go up McFall Road, go up there today. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. I've talked about the central location, right? It's just a good central meeting point for everybody. Now, there are reports in the mid to late 1950s that tend to indicate that Barbara was spending the majority of his time at the Canada Dry Bottling Company or spending his time personally at his estate, essentially acting pretty much like a normal nine to five guy, despite some of the legal battles that he undertook in in 1953 and through 1954 and 55. An interview by FBI special agent Darwin D. Shatral, what a name, uh, of a woman named Mrs. Noreen Eldridge of Endicott, New York, who was in fact Barbara's housekeeper or bookkeeper, not housekeeper, bookkeeper at the Canada Dry Bottling Company, stated the following about Barbara. Quote, Mrs. Eldridge said that Joseph Barbara Sr. was a very dictatorial type of individual and a hard worker. She said prior to his heart attack, he was going from 6 a.m. until late at night. She said that there were many persons who visited at his office prior to the time that he had had a heart attack and recognized most of them as local individuals such as Anthony F. Guarneri, Emmanuel Zakari, and out-of-town people such as Russell Buffalino, Patsy and Sam Monachino. Mrs. Eldridge said that Buffalino, while, at, while in the plant, was usually repairing machines of the CDBC. Mrs. Eldridge said that Buffalino was a very regular visitor. Mrs. Eldridge said that the Monachinos were in the beer business and in recent years had started a soft drink business and they likewise were regular visitors. She said that when there, they were discussing with Mr. Barbara matters concerning operation of the soft drink business. Buffalino also had deals with Barbara concerning discussions in connection with the business. Mrs. Eldridge said that most of the visitors known to her and others unknown to her conversed in Italian while visiting Barbara's office. She said that she did not understand Italian and was suspicious of nothing to indicate any illegal activity involving Barbara. 
Mrs. Eldridge said that on many occasions prior to Barbara's heart attack, he would leave on trips and would not give her any information as to where he was going. She said, however, when he returned, he would tell her that he had either been at the Lexington Hotel in New York City or at the Statler Hotel, Buffalo, New York. She said that all expenses of Barbara's home were paid for uh, from his personal checking account, except expenses in connection with promotional and sales meetings, which were taken from the CDBC account. She said that the expenses for the meat purchased at Armour for the November 14, 1957 meeting were taken from Barbara's personal checking account. Mrs. Eldridge stated that in recent years, Joseph Barbara Sr. drew $497.27 weekly salary and his son, Joseph Barbara Jr., drew $100 uh, a week salary. She advised that there were presently approximately 55 employees of the concern and, and there were a large turnover of employees due to the fact that Barbara was hard to work for. End quote. So, that's a lot to unpack, but let's just focus on the individuals who are noted as visiting Joseph Barbara frequently. First, Anthony F. Guarneri. Guarneri was at this time a lieutenant of Barbara based primarily in Binghamton, New York, who would eventually rise to Capo in the Buffalino family. So he was connected. He was, by all intents and purposes, reputed to be a very capable and deadly guy. The next local ref, uh, referred to in the report was a man named Emmanuel Zakari. Zakari, frequent visitor, was also part of the Buffalino family, operating primarily out of Albany, New York, and would famously be picked up at one of the Appalachian Road blockets in a car with another mafioso, Dominic Alamo. And of course, I think we all know Russell Buffalino by this point. He's pretty much, pretty much, probably the biggest name where you know we've talked about thus far in this episode. Uh, who was showing off his patented mechanic skills, visiting Barbara often at his business as well at his home. And uh, last but not least, Pat uh, and Sam Monacino, who I referenced just moments ago uh, and earlier in the episode, I believe, were the Magadinos family guys. Uh, it was the, you know, they were out of the Magadino family and they were in control of the rackets in Auburn, New York. Very, very, very capable in their own right. So it's very clear by this point, uh, though Mrs. Eldridge probably didn't recognize it, that Barbara is surrounded on all sides by heavy hitters, has major connections in New York City with the five families, Buffalo, and of course, most other major cities within the state of New York, along with northeastern Pennsylvania and probably the rest of Pennsylvania, to be honest. Uh, this guy was way more of a player than he ever gets credit for. Part three, the epic and disastrous finale of Joseph Barbara's story coming very soon. Thank you for listening to the Gangland History Podcast. If you'd like to donate to the show, check out our Patreon channel. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit like and subscribe to help the channel grow. If you're an audio-only listener, subscribe via Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Until next time, don't forget to keep your mouth shut.